what do you do when the tool set that is supposed to make you a lot more efficient actually holds you back? You switch to a more efficient tool set. And that's what Onfido did as they started scaling their microservices environment to over 250 microservices. Our next speakers, Tom and Pedro, specialize in building tooling that helps teams ship faster and more efficiently, thereby reducing the overall cycle time. They will talk through their experience of moving from Jenkins to GitLab CI CD for their microservices environment, as well as the benefits and challenges that they faced along the way. Over to you, Pedro and Tom. My name is Tom. And my name is Pedro. And we're here to talk to you about our journey from Jenkins to GitLab CI to do cloud native deployments at Onfido. Our journey begins in 2019, when Onfido used a combination of Bitbucket and Jenkins to build and ship our software. At the time, we had less than 70 developers and a fairly manageable amount of repositories, but we knew this would begin growing quickly and rapidly in the near future. We used a custom-built Jenkins pipeline consisting of about 8,000 lines of groovy code to provide a simple and common build, test, and deploy process for all of our services with a minimum amount of boilerplate. An example of this is on the right. Uh, so you can see that it uh, is a template that runs some tests using Docker Compose, uh, deploys the resulting um, service to multiple clusters, and runs some Cucumber tests at the end. New repositories had to be configured via merge request to a central Jenkins repository, which wasn't great to begin with. We had other issues with Jenkins, um, specifically speed, stability, isolation, simplicity, flexibility, uh, and user experience. So when it came to speed, Jenkins was not great. Uh, our Jenkins setup was built on EC2 instances that required a large amount of time to spin up when load increased. You could wait up for 10 minutes for a node to become ready, which completely kills the quick sort of build test um, iteration loop that you, you get used to. Stability was an issue. Uh, it would often lock up and require restarting. So it was very common, maybe even several times a day, for someone to go on Slack and say, hey, DevOps, Jenkins is dead. Please restart it. Uh, we even added several custom emojis uh, for this specific case because it was so common. This is exacerbated by Jenkins architecture, which involves a central master node that coordinates all builds on slaves. So if the master fails, then all builds completely halt, even if they could continue by themselves. Um, our services are containerized, but building them was not isolated in Jenkins. So a common thing to find was that uh, the EC2 instances that ran the Jenkins uh, slaves would run out of disk space which would mean that future builds would then um, not be able to complete, which was incredibly frustrating. There were other issues as well that just caused the nodes to become unavailable. So a build would be scheduled, but the node wouldn't start the job or it would fail for random issues. Uh, and the DevOps team would have to go and manually prune those instances on request from developers. Uh, simplicity. Jenkins is not a simple technology at all. Um, for example, pipelines that are written in Groovy uh, can be restarted from any point, including in the middle of executing a loop or even a function. It snapshots the current state of the pipeline after every step, uh, which is super cool and it's also super crazy, I think. Uh, and the end result of this complexity is that it can be incredibly difficult to work out exactly what is what Jenkins is doing and why. We often found ourselves digging through like very huge and verbose Java projects with classes like Jenkins interface, abstract factory, proxy bean, uh, et cetera, classes to, to see why it's not running doc, something simple like Docker build uh, with the correct arguments. These things should be very simple to do, but Jenkins made it quite hard and opaque. Uh, flexibility, so this might be controversial to anyone that's worked a lot with Jenkins. Jenkins is endlessly flexible uh, and that's a pro and a con. There's a fairly large ecosystem of good and bad plugins you can use, and you can author uh, those with yourself, like those pipelines, you can build them yourself, the power of a full programming language backed by a large standard library. However, the flexibility is hugely undermined by the complexity of the system. And in practice, it locks out a huge number of developers who just want to get stuff done. In my opinion, true flexibility isn't when one or two people in an organization or team have the required knowledge to, to wield that flexibility effectively. It's when everyone in an entire engineering team can build and customize their own pipelines in a reasonable amount of time and with a low barrier to entry. Uh, and last but not least, user experience. Uh, at the time, the Jenkins UI was terrible. 
viewing logs would sometimes freeze your browser. And in general, the interface just looked really dated. Um, it wasn't well integrated with the rest of our tool, uh, rest of our uh, tooling. It just wasn't a great user experience at all. So we set out to solve these problems and we settled on GitLab CI to do that. Um, we configured our CI cluster to run on Kubernetes, which is a platform that we use for all of our other workloads and that gives us a quick um, scalability, isolation and reduced costs due to more efficient application of builds. Uh, we created a large set of includes that projects could uh, use to quickly bootstrap a project. These included functions like building an image using a Docker and Docker daemon, so it's isolated, testing that image in a separate build stage, uh, so you don't have to rebuild the image uh, to run the tests, and then publishing that image uh, to a central container registry prior to deployment. The included definitions would also set up stages for deploying to clusters. Um, so centrally managing these deployment targets meant that adding a new cluster could be done in a single place rather than having to go through and update every single service. More importantly, GitLab CLA resulted in a high degree of team independence. So teams could use the pre built pipeline, but they could also add other steps uh, with the full flexibility that GitLab CI, uh, GitLab CI offers. So this is the end result of a pipeline. Um, this is an example service. So we build our image, we run some tests, we publish it, then we begin deploying to one of our many different clusters. Uh, the team working on this project has customized it with extra things like uh, load testing and uh, contract testing. Some of these are includes that they've built and some of them are service specific ones that they've just added to, to GitLab CI .yam. So we, uh, when we started the migration, um, we had a lot of bespoke legacy and untemplated Kubernetes resources that we wanted to migrate to a more standardized deployment. Um, so we started by building an internal tool called Kubo, uh, which applies Ginger 2 templating to Kubernetes resources, uh, including variables, conditionals, and custom functions. Uh, Ginger 2 is a very common Python templating library. It's used in the Flask web framework, for example, uh, and it's quite neat and, and simple to read. So you can see uh, in the code snippet, we have some variables that are interpolated. So the namespace, um, we have support for conditionals. So if you wanted to add a specific uh, thing, attribute or whatever block in a specific cluster, you can do that. And we have custom functions. So one of those is JSON from, which reads a YAML file, uh, runs templating uh, and any interpolation that's required, converts the result into a JSON object, which can be then safely embedded in the YAML. On top of this, we uh, wanted to add some more consistency to our deployments. So this includes uh, Kubernetes specific labels. Um, it'd be nice to look in Kubernetes and know where each deployment came from, the origin source, the repository, even the team that owned it. So we added the ability to define transformers inside Kubo to mutate the resources uh, that is actually templating. So Kubo would run the templating, it would create the Kubernetes resources, then it would lint that. Uh, you could define simple functions that operate on specific entity types. So in the example, we added a simple function that uh, operates on a project ID, or operates on a deployment and adds a project ID label to, to each of the deployments. We added more complex ones, like adding specific data log tracing labels. Um, and we found this to be quite an effective way of ensuring consistency, despite us having a lot of um, ad hoc uh, Kubernetes resources. We also added support for custom linting rules to Kubo to catch common errors. Uh, the one on the screen ensures there's a back off limit and is applied to every single job um, before it's deployed. There's other ones that we've found common patterns and, and common errors that we wanted to catch. Um, doing this in, in simple Python code allowed us to be quite flexible. It, at the start of the deployment, uh, at the start of the pipeline, Kubo would lint the resources after they're generated and they would display an error that's defined in the doc string of the Python function and it would display what the issue was and how you can fix it. So in this case, adding a back off limit um, and it's important because not having it is a bad thing. So the variables that are interpolated in part come from scoped environment variables. So we have a set of these configured for each cluster, each deployment target with information about the namespace, the AWS account ID and other internal values that might be interpolated. And all these resources are placed in a, a common directory inside the root of the repository. The tool combines these results into a single YAML file, uh, lints it, validates it, injects it, or mutates it, and then deploys it to Kubernetes. 
The end result of this is we have 2.12 million um, builds across uh, 300,000 pipelines. Uh, we have over seven years of CI build time in total. We've had zero outages or instance across this, despite tripling the engineering team size and hugely increasing the number of, of projects, pipelines, and jobs. Uh, this is amazing. However, plot twist. Is this the new Jenkins? Yes. Is this the new Jenkins? Uh... The problem with uh, creating a new pipeline that is meant to replace exactly step by step an existing pipeline is that it's going to inherit a few of its issues. Complex Groovy uh, led to complex YAML and Bash. Uh, and given that the old pipeline in Jenkins was extremely rigid and difficult to manage, it liked a lot of, for example, error management, uh, which ended being inherited by this pipeline in the process. If something went out of the expected path, for example, if a deploy failed, or if a build uh, had problems, or if the test failed, the pipeline provided uh, at best cryptic error messages that were not exactly easy to digest. You can see that as an example in the screen here. Um, the deployment of a new uh, a new deployment fails in the middle of a rollout, and after several other steps that appear with a lot of green that looks very positive, it even shows a random success message at the bottom. Uh, this would result in several messages on the sub DevOps support channel uh, asking what had happened, that the, the logs seemed good, but that the pipeline had failed or it failed to deploy somehow. And, given, and even though it was much better than Jenkins, there was no need to uh, have to restart Jenkins every two days or every half day. Uh, this was still complex and led to a lot of false positives in the process of configuring and, use, and using the pipelines. Uh, the other large problem was about uh, the, the fact that we had a lot of duplicate resources. YAML was spread across all the repos of projects that we had. Uh, and the teams that uh, owned those repos weren't exactly the people with the expertise and the interest in improving and changing that YAML to uh, improve things in general. As a result, uh, it was but, uh, a burden sometimes to have to uh, go to every project and change this. It was in fact so complicated uh, that uh, we ended up creating a tool to automatically open merge requests in every single repo for each of the changes that we had to do. And we had to use this quite a few times. Even then, this made, meant that a change that could perhaps be done in a two, two or three hours in a centralized situation took weeks to do on a decentralized approach like this. With the start of the year and the start of the quarter, uh, we had a new goal across engineering to improve our stability. And one of the things that we wanted to do to improve stability was to be able to uh, increase the pace of deploys without increasing the, the pace of errors. So in a way, our goal was to deploy with confidence. How did we go to do that? How do you improve the confidence on deploying? Uh, well, you can do, uh, we looked into three specific approaches. Uh, first, we decided to reduce the impact of failure. We tried to add canaries by default to all projects and send a small pro portion of traffic to the new version before going fully live uh, with a new release. Uh, we also decided that automatically uh, rolling back a new release when the error rate is high was a good approach. So we uh, implemented a way to monitor the error rate of the deployment. And based on the percentage of uh, traces that had errors as a result, immediately roll back if it went over that threshold. And at last, we decided that moving the Kubernetes away from the developer's repos and into a centralized approach where a dedicated team with the knowledge and the interest and the uh, information required was a good approach to make this uh, more scalable when it comes to changing YAML. For the implementation of canaries we, and for the automated rollbacks, we went with Argo Rollouts. Argo Rollouts is a specific project within the Argo CD uh, project, which is incredibly useful. It provides an easy and familiar way to implement blue-greens and canary deployments by creating its custom resource definition, uh, the rollout, which is in all ways 
similar to the existing resource definition of Kubernetes, the deployment. Uh, the advantage of this is that even though it's almost exactly the same, the rollout, the rollout strategies allow us to also specify a blue green or canary. And inside that rollout strategy, we can also add analysis templates that allow us to query either Kubernetes or some other uh, uh, metrics provider to uh, roll out automat roll back automatically if there is a high chance or of failure. And instead of having the YAML in each repository, we used Helm to create a template, a centralized template that abstracts away all the complexity from the developers. The developers, instead of having uh, all the YAML in the repository, have a set of uh, values files where they can specify a high-level approach to what will be then implemented on the template. Although we can use GitLab's Auto DevOps directly, we took every inspiration from it on the implementation of the solution. One quick thing I want to add, which was incredibly useful for us, is the use of the Helm unit test plugin, which allows us to, allowed us to have confidence that the rather complex template that we were developing uh, was correct and did not introduce uh, bugs with every new release. In a way, we can now deploy the pipeline the itself with confidence. In a nutshell, uh, Helm unit test allows us to create suites of tests. Uh, we can then specify uh, parameters uh, to the values and then assert statements about the resulting generated templates. Uh, this, uh, we use this extensively to either test the behavior and to prevent regressions either in implementation or interface uh, packs. So, as a result, this was what was required before with Kubo to deploy. We can see here several things. Uh, it might look a bit scary, but this is just Kubernetes uh, YAML. Uh, we specify a deployment with a set of parameters. Uh, we specify a service, an horizontal pod autoscaler, an ingress to expose the, ser the, the service to the outside, and a migration job. Uh, fairly standard uh, standard resources, all bait a bit verbose given the nature of Kubernetes. The resulting new pipeline can do the same thing uh, in much less code. Uh, in here we can see the values YAML used to generate both the deployment, service, ingress, horizontal pod autoscaler, and horizontal pod autoscaler. It reduces the amount of code required by easily three or four to a third or a, th a fourth of the total size uh, required for normal projects. And it abstracts away all of these implementation details from the developers and allows them to be centralized and to be updated at once for every project if need be. In addition to that, the GitLab CI.yaml uh, stays pretty much similar. It removes uh, the need for some variables that were required before, as they are now automatically inferred from the values files that are specified by the developers. Um, the resulting pipeline is also very similar. Uh, it keeps the same process of uh, running the unit tests, uh, running the builds, and publishing the Docker image, as well as publishing as deploying to the various environments. Uh, the main differences are that the deploy jobs now have automated knowledge, thanks to Argo, to roll back uh, automatically if the, there is a high error rate. And in addition to that, we also added a manual rollback step next to the deploy step itself in case there is an, uh, any other unexpected situations to make this quick and immediate for the developers. In a nutshell, there were several benefits that we were able to see uh, on our migration from GitLab to Jenkins. Uh, GitLab proved to be much better than Jenkins in many aspects. Uh, it managed to scale on the number of jobs and on the, on the number of the CI, uh, CI uh, pipelines that we ran in a way that Jenkins never was. It, we run now many, many more times uh, uh, um, of jobs and the hours of pipelines than we did before with Jenkins. And it fails. Um, it it doesn't fail with um, with the pro in the process. It just is much easier and stable to use. And at the same time, it managed to scale in terms of complexity, as more and more projects were projects were able to implement their own unique specific situations in addition to the standard pipeline that we provided. 
in a way, by being simpler to use, it opened the doors for more developers to use it and touch it and modify it and ended up being more flexible than Jenkins ever could for those people. It's not all roses. There were some issues in this development or some challenges that we encountered. Um, so one of the questions we asked ourselves to begin with is would auto DevOps be uh, a solution to this? Um, it looks nice. It seems somewhat similar, uh, an opinionated framework using Helm that kind of just deployed things. Um, it's promising, but it is also very opinionated. Uh, it's probably a good thing if you are starting completely from scratch uh, with a fresh set of infrastructure on GitLab and you are okay with adopting everything that Auto DevOps gives you. However, if you're migrating from an existing infrastructure uh, or existing deployment process, uh, it's not simple. You have to adapt your projects to work with this. Um, it just looked like a huge amount of work. On top of that, there were things missing like deployments to different clusters, um, uh, specific rollout patterns that we wanted. Uh, we run multiple development, production, and staging clusters um, for redundancy. It wasn't entirely clear how we would fit those patterns into Auto DevOps and how we would customize it going down the line. Um, there were some surprising things as well. So during the very start of this, the lack of scoped environment variables at the group level um, was a quite annoying limitation for us. Uh, we use scoped environment variables to configure cluster specific variables um, for interpolation with Kubernetes resources. So for example, namespaces. Um, these have to be defined at the project level. Unfortunately, um, we had to build some tooling that would take a set of these variables and the scopes, and it would have to use the GitLab API to apply those to every single new project that's created under the Onfido group. This could be implemented as a pipeline. Um, it's okay to build, but it's just an annoyance that we had to overcome. We also had to set up webhooks for new projects uh, when they're created to then trigger this pipeline on those to then configure the variables. And if it failed for whatever reason, um, the deployment steps just wouldn't work because those variables or the, the scoped environment variables just wouldn't exist, which is not a great experience. Um, on, the, on the talk of webhooks, um, things like deployment event webhooks didn't exist uh, at the time. This has been changed recently, I think, um, but we wanted to, to put an event in Datadog or Splunk or, or another monitoring system whenever a GitLab deployment uh, succeeded uh, or failed. So this counts for like Terraform, Kubernetes, copying something to S3, like whatever the project counts as a deployment, we would like to have it consistently monitored and logged in, in our tooling. To get away with this, we had to, um, to get around the lack of webhook support for this, we have to embed um, some various tools inside each of the images that do deployments, like for Terraform or, or anything else, that would then call some external services with some secrets and credentials that are configured. This is not ideal. Um, what we really want is a webhook sync that just receives, hey, this product deployed this. It can then put it in Splunk, put it in Datadog, copy it to wherever it wants. Bash itself, uh, it's powerful, but it's complex. Uh, and there's definitely a lack of reusability for commands, uh, which is kind of annoying. So um, at the start, when we built, when we transferred Jenkins to, to GitLab CI, we kind of took the existing Jenkins Groovy code and translated it into Bash, including loops and et cetera, et cetera. Um, a better way of doing this for us would have been to be more modular. So maybe use Bash functions or use specific tools that we write in other languages and compose them together with GitLab CI. The lack of reusability uh, was surprising as well. So things like um, CI blocks, uh, before script, after script, script, any kind of array stuff, isn't merged when you, like they're overridden. So if you extend the build image stage and you want to add one statement to the before script, you would have to copy the entire contents of the before script, add it to the, uh, to the, the bit you're overriding, and then also add your specific customizations to this. This has been changed, so you can now uh, reference those uh, and you don't need to, to do this. But this has changed recently. For a long time, this was impossible and it led to a few copy and paste incidents. Uh, other than that, there are sort of many small paper cluts along the way. Uh, GitLab is a big platform that's growing quite a lot and evolving. Um, there were some bugs around uh, uh, the way that we include things. 
not small issues, but overall, not too many, um, which was refreshing to see uh, compared to issues we had with Jenkins plugins and other um, CI related things in the past. So thank you. You can contact us at the links uh, on screen. And we work, both work for Enfido and Enfido is hiring. So if you are interested in coming to work for us, um, we have a, a large number of very interesting challenges around the document identity space and a bunch of other spaces we're launching into. Uh, come check out our careers on the, the link um, uh, on screen. And yeah, come work for us. Come experience our beautiful pipeline. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.